There's a great show on television here in the UK called uh, Charlie Booker's Newswipe. It's the third in a series, I think, that Charlie Booker's done. He, does, he did one on games called Gameswipe and one on television called Screenwipe. And he also used to do a... Uh, well, just like a... a I don't know what you call it, an article in the, in the Guardian newspaper um, about television. It's always the same kind of take he has. It's this really cynical, slightly world-weary take on... Uh, you know, whatever he's looking at, so it was games or television and now it's the news. It's a brilliant show, but one of the things he has on this show is this small segment by uh, a guy who goes by the name of Doug Stanhope. It's a, it's a character piece, but it's really great. Doug Stanhope, whose tagline is, I'm Doug Stanhope, that's why I drink. And it's this American alcoholic, I guess, who does these short monologues, which are... Um, deeply, deeply misanthropic in the best way. They're just fantastic. Uh, so I take on just some, on some subject and just really lay out in, in a gorgeous way how awful it is. It's, fun. it's just great. He did one on fear, which was superb. Just talking about how, how attracted we are to fear and how our media sells us on fear and we're constantly being encouraged to imagine terrorists taking out our Ford Focus or uh, how MRSA will take us out in hospital and if not we're going to die of swine flu then we'll die of bird flu and how fear kind of colonises us and not only does it colonise us but we're, we, we actively seek it out we're a fantastic market for fear we just love it and he says there that the uh, the reason why we, have to, we are so attracted to fear is because it's to mask the reality that now our whole sorry lives nothing of any significance will ever happen to us it's just brilliant. But the um, the one I was watching a few days ago was one he did, this Doug Stanhope did, on uh, population and ecology. And he's basically just taking on this idea of, you know, here we all are, recycling and, and driving around in hybrids and, uh, and being very concerned about fossil fuels and those kind of things. And he says that the uh, the unspoken agenda is always... The fact that we're living in a, in a we've got populate, a human population of over six billion, and uh, a world which can probably support about a third of that, maybe, and then just about, and the fact that we're pretty much on a collision course with, uh, with a, a completely Malthusian reality of running out of resources, uh, and the fact that nobody's talking about that. He does this great stuff about that, the hypocrisy of driving around in a Prius with a baby seat in the back. Because of course the amount of, uh, of resources that you, the amount of the world's resources that you save, or the amount of global, you know, your carbon footprint you don't lay down, is uh, is one hundredth of the amount that you actually put into the environment just by the act of raising a child, which is, uh, as I say, deeply misanthropic and a hard one to take. But it's a fantastic monologue. I will, uh, if I can find it, I think it's on YouTube. I'll try and put the the link in the sidebar. But uh, I think this thing about population really does raise an interesting issue. There's, there's, um, not because it's... I mean, it is a hot-button issue, but I'm just wondering, you know, what you can do about that, really. Part of, I think one of the reasons why it's a hot-button issue is because it's, uh, it hasn't been very well imagined. You know, I think a lot of the ways that we imagine the future is by creating fictions about it, writing novels or making movies about it, telling jokes about it. You know, science fiction kind of predicts the future for us, not in its reality, in its detail, but just in its uh, kind of emotional tone, I guess, or whether we can look forward to it or not. Uh, but we haven't really imagined any particularly good futures in which diminishing population, low birth rate, those kind of things, would be part of any kind of future we'd want to live in. I mean, certainly the movies and the, the novels that take that on are always dystopian visions of the Handmaid's Tale, the Margaret Atwood novel that was turned into a into a film, is is deeply a dystopian. You know, it's this hierarchical caste system society in which only the highly select few are given the opportunity to reproduce. And it's you know it's a fascist state basically to to organise this this strange priestly hierarchy around birthrights. Or uh, City of Men, which is, is again, this very bleak dystopian vision. Again, a police state 
in which for some reason people have just stopped having children. It doesn't give you any backstory on that, it just presents you with this world. And it's a world in chaos in which all the adults have just lost the will to live because there's no, uh, there's no young to project their DNA into the future, I guess. So it's just constant riots and constant uh, unpleasantness. And, and the, the birth of the one child in that film, which is the plot line really, about this one child that is born in a world without any children, is presented as a, well, it's a kind of messianic moment, really. And there's lots of sacrifice around it and lots of uh, activities around this, the birth of this child, which is, uh, you know, as I say, it, 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 it acts as a, a kind of a redemption, really. So, and even at the other end of the scale, you know, not so much for a limiting birth rate. If we were to go to the other end of the, the lifespan and think about uh, reducing a population by culling the old, if you like, or at least by offering euthanasia or making it more easily available, or just by making some kind of medical choices, then uh, again, there's, there's, no, there's no pleasant vision of that either. The, uh, the ones that spring to mind there is a great film, I think it's in the 1970s, called Logan's Run, in which no one gets to live past 30. You can have as many kids as you want, I guess. But at 30, they all have to go to Carousel, which is this weird kind of ritual they have to go to, where they try to fly their way out of their terminal condition. And of course, nobody succeeds because it's all a fraud. Uh, and another and other films like... Um, what's that film? Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it now. It's got the guy who is in Planet of the Apes. Charlton Heston in it. Uh, Soylent Green. Again, that's a kind of overpopulation story in which euthanasia is made freely available. And you actually and you terminate your condition in quite a pleasant way by the looks of it in Soylent Green. But again, it's a dystopian vision. It's not a pleasant vision of... Um, of a world in which someone has taken seriously the fact that population is a problem and is perhaps doing something about it. I suppose all I'm saying is there, it'd be quite nice if there was some utopian visions. Actually, the nearest thing to a utopian vision, and it isn't presented as one at all, I think, is uh, the, the the movie version, and I guess the novel version, of H.G. Of, uh, Wells... Um, God, what's it called? Time Machine, that's it, The Time Machine. It's a great film version of that. And in the future, there's, there are two races of humans in, in this strange future. There's the Morlocks, who live underground as, as kind of troglodytes and, and shy away from the light. And then there's the Eloi, who, uh, who the, the main character in the film comes across first. And they live this beautiful kind of pastoral existence, just picking fruit off the trees and uh, having this great life, you know, just lounging around by these sparkling streams. They're all Aryan, of course, they're all blue-eyed and blonde-haired, but apart from that... Uh, and the only... And, and that looks like a beautiful future. The, uh, the only downside of that future is that the Eloi, the, these, uh, uh, these kind of lotus-eaters of the, of the future, are effectively bred as a food supply for the Morlocks, and every once in a while a great siren sounds, and after Eloy, I have to go underground to be consumed by the Morlocks. Which again, I suppose, is a bit dystopian thinking about it. But until, um, you know, until the guy from the 20th century turns up and, uh, and causes havoc, it's a system that seems to work quite well, actually. It doesn't look very pleasant from 20th, 21st century eyes. But the Eloi don't seem to care about being used as a food supply, and the Morlocks don't seem to mind at all about living underground and eating them. So, uh, I'm certainly not presenting that as a utopian vision of the future. It's the only one I can think of. We could probably do with a better one, actually. We could probably do with a, a really great utopian vision of the future, in which human population is either severely restricted, or reduced to zero, or just, dimin or just eradicated completely. Actually, the nearest thing I've found ever to a, a utopian vision of the future, which involves some major effect on humans, is uh, that TV show. I think it was called something like "The World Without Us." I might, I might be the title wrong, but it's you know what the world will look like in a in hundred years, a thousand years, ten thousand years, half a million years, if humans just kind of disappear from the planet, just disappear. It's fantastic. So there's all these visions of New York slowly crumbling and being overcome by overgrown with vines and lianas. 
and, uh, and deer and flocks of birds just flying between these crumbling skyscrapers. It's great. It's not, uh, it's not ideal from an egocentric human point of view because of course we're not there anymore. But there's a kind of romantic pastoral vision of the future. It is pretty utopian.